All right. Now let's turn to um, a, a different situation, a decidedly different one. So Nathan Robinson of uh, Current Affairs um, magazine wrote a piece that was critical of a book by uh, Crystal Ball and Sager. Um, what's his last name? And Jetty. And Jetty. They do a show on uh, The Hill, which is a, um, a conservative outlet. But, owned by yeah. a personal friend of Trump's. Yeah, okay, there you go. And they wrote a book that the premise, and I have not read it, so I'm going to take Nathan's um, assessment of it as accurate. He's in a debate with Glenn Greenwald about it. Glenn doesn't seem to refute it. Uh, that there is more in common between right-wing populism and left-wing populism than there is between left-wing populism and, let's say, Biden and what he represents. <clears throat> um, now, of course, for that premise to be true, there actually has to be a right-wing populism, A, and B, theoretically, it should be like an economic one, right? Because that's what we mean by left-wing populism. We mean economic populism, right? Um, let's watch this exchange, and then, Jamie, you and I can have at it. I, I mean, I don't believe that. That's not what I believe. That's not the argument, right? The argument is first, so first, is it correct to say that there is a right-wing populist movement in America that has a lot in common with the left? And I think the thesis that uh, Saga and Crystal put forward is basically that it has a lot more in common with the left than the left has with Joe Biden. Right. Because the entire framing is there are two kinds of authentic working class politics. There's the right wing authentic working class politics. There's the left wing authentic working class politics. We are the unified politics against all the elites. And here are all the things we agree on. And the book is about all the things they agree on. Right. Uh, mostly. Mostly. There's some slight differences. Um, and. First off, I don't think that really is there. It really is a right wing movement that sh that overlaps very much. There's just like some Republicans who have slightly softer positions on some things, sometimes important things. Sometimes it's just because they're libertarian. Is there? But is there a big left wing populist movement in the U.S.? Like who in the Congress besides Bernie and AOC and I guess you could say like Ilhan Omar and not in the Congress. Talib, like yeah, like who in the Congress are left wing populists? Not in Congress. So where are they? Where's this left-wing populist movement? You could ask the same question about the that. The Bernie presidential campaign. The, the, the one that the one that failed to win twice, even within the yes, confines of the Democratic win. Party. The existence. If the fact that you don't win doesn't mean you don't have a political. But, I mean, movement. but apparently, like there were a lot of people in the Republican Party now, who pause found it for one second. Trump's pause it for one second. Pause it for one second. So, first of all, Glenn is equating elected officials with the existence of a movement now i don't i don't um i i think i think elected officials can be indicative of a movement but i don't think they're the same thing i don't think that's the way you assess the existence of it i also think that to say like you know aoc and bernie and ilan omar are the only left-wing populists in uh congress i think is uh, a rather narrow definition of, of left-wing populism. I mean, we have um, a decent, I wouldn't say many in the Senate, but, you know, folks like Tammy Baldwin, maybe, and... Um, Sherrod Brown, definitely. And Sherrod Brown. Um, strongly populist, I think. And I, you could argue there's maybe, you know, one or two more who are very sort of like uh, labor-oriented. There could be a couple more, actually. Uh, but in the House, there's even more uh, of folks like that. There's not tons, but there's certainly, you know, as many as like there was in the uh, Freedom Caucus. Mm -hmm. But it's just weird to equate a left wing populist movement with necessarily elected officials and then also to dismiss the relevance of the second place finisher in the uh, Democratic primaries being a very definitional, you know, like leader of a left-wing populist movement um, or indicative of one. That seems like rather dismissive, but let's continue on. 
I mean, you don't have a political. But, I mean, movement. but apparently, like there were a lot of people in the Republican Party who found Trump's populist rhetoric in 2016 appealing enough to make him the nominee. I agree with that. So I don't. Why? Why do you keep minimizing what right wing populism is and maximizing what left wing populism? Okay, pause well, it, if it's again, pause if it, pause it. now he's also now. It's weird because now there's a question of like, is there more left wing populism than there is right wing populism? But but these are two different species. Yeah. Like just because it is anti establishment, as it were, and anti, um, po- you know, outsidery versus insidery. Uh, these are not the same things. The right wing populism that Donald Trump ran on was very different than what a left wing populism would be. But we'll get to that. We'll get. We, I just want to. I just want to make sure that we are hearing these key points as we go through. You keep minimizing what right wing populism is and maximizing what left wing populism okay, is. Okay. Well, if it's again, if it's Trumpism, if it's Trump, then we need to be honest about the fact that when we're talking about a right-wing populist movement in America. We're talking about the Trump 2016 campaign. Right. I think that's and a fair, a re- roughly the, accurate like representation of what it could be. Trump 2016 campaign being what I consider a gigantic fraud okay. perpetrated on working but people. Ima- but imagine if it weren't. Like, imagine if Steve Bannon <laughs> had followed through on what Trump yes, said he wanted to do. It, I mean, yeah. Right. Imagine it wasn't reality, a, 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 like a talk show host who has no fixed views, but somebody Okay, so then now this I just want to point this out, and then Jamie, I'll let you get, like provide some analysis. So they both agree that the right wing populism is the Trump campaign of 2016, <clears throat> and then Glenn says, and 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 then Nathan says it was a fraud, but I think there's a step missed there because I want to know exactly what populist what economic populist populism Donald Trump pushed. Now he did say that he wouldn't cut social security or Medicare. Fair enough. But I want to know relative to Hillary Clinton from a policy standpoint, from a policy standpoint, not from like what her record had been in this and that, because, because Glenn has now moved it to like, what if we could believe what he was saying? Right? So we're going to take both candidates at face value. What did Donald Trump say that was more economic populist than Hillary Clinton? Economically, because there is a form of populism that Donald Trump certainly did promote. (laughs) And it was nativism, undoubtedly, far greater than his so-called economic populism. But I wouldn't know, like, yes, he spoke far more economically populist than a typical Republican, but he didn't offer anything more economic populist than Hillary Clinton, did he? Well, I, I'm guessing that he's thinking about his sort of vulgar critiques of free trade deals and globalization and things of that nature. Hillary Clinton was against to, uh, PPP. She was reluctant, granted, but we're now supposed to take everything at face value that they said, right? What if it yeah. wasn't a fraud? The populism is just anti-Clintonism. Mm-hmm. Yes. But he's also, he's making a substitution already when he says, well, what if he had listened to Steve Bannon and done what Steve Bannon wants to do? Which right. Steve Bannon does represent a kind of European style right populism that combines uh, trade protectionism, uh, restrictions on immigration, and some form of welfare state for citizens. And it's closely associated with the rise of fascist parties in Europe. Right. right. I mean, what, it's like the functional equivalent of like, what if Hillary Clinton listened to her most economically progressive person on her staff? Yeah, I mean, populism is just a way to obscure uh, the labor capital divide and make it about the insider outsider divide. And like the labor capital divide is probably more in, um, more explanatory for how to understand, say, the way rising will sway. Uh, who funds it, like Jamie brought up already. Like, these are clear, it's not, like, this is like, it's as if we're not letting everybody, like, I don't know, I don't know. It's It seems disingenuous. As I... It's completely disingenuous. I'm sorry. I mean, look, the 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 idea that, and, and supposedly the idea that I think Glenn is trying to uh, articulate here is that people were drawn to Trump 
because of his economic populist rhetoric. And what if he actually, so therefore there is a movement that exists on the right, whether Trump actually had any intention of fulfilling that rhetoric or not, there is a movement on the right, but there's no evidence. That's what drew people to Trump. I think to the extent that he had any economic populism that drew people in, it was like they came in despite that. They didn't care. They Brothers, liked that they he wanted, was no. they, they liked they that he was liked, the cultural rich guy. Like he was he, a cultural rich guy. That's the populism there. Yeah. Yes. The, yeah. the the populism that they liked was saying F you to the establishment. What do they perceive from the establishment? Is it because the the establishment was going to do, you know, tax cuts for the wealthy? I mean, we didn't see any depreciable, um, uh, we didn't see any decline in Donald Trump's approval ratings when they did tax cuts for the rich. We didn't see any decline in Donald Trump's, um, you know, uh, 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 numbers when he wanted to cut Medicaid or when he wanted to uh, cut, uh, you know, we started talking about cutting Social Security and, and entitlements. We didn't see that. And if the thesis was correct that people came to Donald Trump because of his economic populism, we would have. All of those people, short of a small segment that went from Obama to Trump, went from Obama to Trump, voted for Mitt Romney. That's just the bottom line. Yeah. And so, like, you know, the, the idea that this was about that Trump's win was a function of his economic populism. And therefore we can extrapolate that there's some type of right wing economic populist movement is absurd. Yeah. yeah. He's being very disingenuous when he substitutes uh, Trump's ability to win power. Uh, therefore uh, his policies must be populist. Like the one does not follow from the other. No, yeah. And like I say, like what, like, you know, he, he went after trade stuff. And I mean, presumably he's done that, right? I mean, on some level, like protectionist policies and yet his numbers have gone down, right? Like, like the, the, the idea that, that, that Donald Trump won because of populist rhetoric, as opposed to attacking sort of like the establishment. Remember he won, you know, not huge numbers. Uh, you know, he won by very, very narrow margins in areas. And I think we're finding out because Hillary Clinton was a uniquely flawed <laughs> candidate, particularly for that era and particularly against him. I mean, there's just, there is this, um, I, 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 there's no substance to that argument. Like there's no data to support it. There's no substance to support it. And for it's a, a it's a creation of media elites. This is about rebranding conservatism to sell d different kinds of books. Mm -hmm. And they do this all the time. Last time around, it was by um, Reformacons. Um, the, it was like... Oh, I remember those guys. They're all at the yeah. National Review, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Like, I used to do a lot of TV with one of the guys. He seems to have completely vanished from the face. I can't here. remember any of their names anymore. Yes. I mean, this, this comes up always like this and then the next move will be like it's it's to libertarianism again and it just cycles back around like i'm sorry there is i imagine some like there is there are mo there are areas where you you can find a transpartisan alliance that might make sense on a limited basis like criminal justice reform you can find some uh, common ground with and, and 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 legalizing drugs with you know, like a Rand Paul to the extent that you could trust him. I don't know, but there is a streak there that exists, but this is all just garbage. It is just garbage and it is disingenuous. I'm not, uh, look, uh, I, I think there is like very valid critiques about the institutions that lead us that are corrupted. And, but to the, this is not, the way to make that argument in a um, in a a sound way. It's just there's not it's not supported. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that from a material benefit, material benefit, Joe Biden is going to be far more materially beneficial than Donald Trump and yeah. the people around Joe Biden, since we're giving so much credit to Steve Bannon, are going to end up providing far more material benefit as measured on a left-wing populism, that is economic populism, 
And whether that's like strengthening unions or uh, expansion of social security or Medicaid, it's not going to be nearly as far as I want it to go, but it's going to be closer. And they may be doing it in service of like trying to tamp down, you know, some type of greater uh, left wing sort of like populist movement. But nevertheless, in terms of like the actual policy outcomes, it's just an absurd argument. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm disappointed in Crystal and the whole framing of this as being about canceling rising. This is about forcing you to defend your thesis about a cross-partisan populism. That's what this is. Yeah. And a lot of people are very skeptical, I think, for right, uh, correct reasons. Yeah. Is, is there more in this video? I don't think there is. I that's that's we have. Because I had some stuff to say about this. Go. I mean, uh, where do I begin? It's weird, right? Because there are people in the center who like to collapse all populisms together as a way of saying that Bernie is like the boogeyman and populism is scary and Bernie and Trump are the same, yada, yada. That's obviously false. Um, and the people on Rising are trying to collapse them in a similar way, but to make a case for them, for people who hate the Democratic establishment. But it's just as fatuous and it's just as disingenuous like you want to talk about right-wing populism right i've had a lot of people in my mentions lately so i've been forced to pay attention to this i'd never watched rising before claiming oh right populists and left populists they sh they may not agree on social issues but they can work together on economic issues right i mean a i have seen very little evidence that republicans want to be progressive on economic issues but no. even that were the if, even if that were the case you cannot separate the social from the economic. Like people smarter than me, right? Historians like Mike Davis have come to the conclusion that one of the biggest barriers to working class power throughout the history of this country has been racism and xenophobia, right? These are not just social issues totally divorced from the economic. A Whole Foods union busting manual that came out recently said one good indicator that your, uh, your store is less likely to unionize is if there's more diversity on staff. Right. Which is the, just depressing as hell. But it's, it's more and more evidence that like you cannot disaggregate these issues. And the only way that we're going to get working class power is if we fight racism, xenophobia, homophobia, sexism, all of those things at the same time. Yeah. Like yeah. these categories were literally formalized hundreds of years ago to make it easier to exploit certain classes of people. Yeah. Right wing populism arose as a response to a credible challenge from the left. You want to talk about the birth of fascism? We could talk about Mussolini's Italy. There right. were tons of anarchists and communists trying to unite as a class and overthrow an exploitative system. And fascism arose because they needed to capture the popular energy of a grassroots movement um, while at the same time upholding the system through uh, bonds of cross-class bonds of nationalism, right? And it has been fairly effective throughout history. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the, the idea, I mean, I, I, I want to see, like, show me the evidence of these right-wing populists f pursuing in any like concerted or consistent or um, yeah. like, like right. tangible it's way in for any type of like economic populism. That's like, what's so weird about the whole thing is like, we watch this stuff every day. We're reading every single headline and we don't even have this evidence to put it's it. It's vaporware. It's yeah. completely vaporware. Yes. Josh Hawley comes out and says a couple of things about, and, right. and, and, and great, like, you know, great. But Josh Hawley is not a movement. And he's right? not, like, this is, it, they are, if there was a movement, if there was a legitimate movement, there would not be this huge push, huge push to sort of like essentially uh, latch on to the left's populist movement. And yeah, that's what's it, going on here. Let's be clear right. what the project here is, is that we don't have anybody in our movement. So we're going to pretend like there's this shell of a movement Holly? and suck people in. Yeah. yeah, and he's totally ignoring, like what does he think just happened in all 50 states? Does he think that we were all just doing neoliberal identity politics? Uh, talking about prison abolition and black liberation. 
Like, no, this is a working class movement. This is a popular, a populist movement in favor of democracy and in favor of, you know, respecting the rights of everybody in the working class, regardless of their color. And just on the Josh Hawley thing, like those, it's so annoying that those guys get brought up as if they're the Ilhan Omars of the GOP. Hawley and Cotton aren't doing anything that GOP leadership doesn't like. Yeah, and both went to uh, Harvard and Yale Law (laughs) School. PMCs, those guys. Total PMCs.